Ma'am, you can introduce the next speaker. Yeah, yeah, hi. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Upma Bhatia Batra. She is professor at LHMC, uh, New Delhi. And uh, her areas of interest are airway, USJ guided regional anesthesia. I welcome Dr. Upma Bhatia to present her uh, talk today in APEC 23, first session of APEC 23. So you are very important to us. Kindly start your talk. Thank you, ma'am. Good morning to all. I want to thank Dr. MD Kaur and team APEC for giving me the opportunity to speak about ASA standard monitoring and its clinical interpretation. American Society of Anesthesiologists laid down standards for monitoring under anesthesia in 1986, and these were last amended in December 2020. The term monitoring is derived from the Latin word monia, which means to remind or to warn. Therefore, standard one mandates presence of a qualified anesthetist throughout the duration of anesthesia and surgery because no amount of automated monitors can replace the vigilance and ongoing clinical examination by a qualified anesthetist. Standard two mandates that continual evaluation of oxygen, ventilation, circulation and temperature will be done in patients undergoing any kind of anesthesia. Monitoring of Oxygen concentration in the breath patient breathing system must be measured by an oxygen analyzer and a low concentration uh, oxygen alarm limit must be in place and this must be checked during routine preoperative checking of the anesthesia machine. Because under anesthesia there is hypoventilation and increase in shunt due to increase in due to venous admixture. The inspired oxygen concentration during maintenance of anesthesia needs to be increased to 30% even in healthy individuals and in patients who have impaired delivery of oxygen to the tissues due to anemia or low cardiac output states or increased requirements of oxygen may be due to fever or uh, sepsis-like conditions, further supplementation of oxygen are required. It is imperative to monitor inspired oxygen concentration when giving low-flow anesthesia to the patient to avoid hypoxic mixture delivery. Care must be taken that inspired oxygen alarm limits do not help us in detecting the disconnection of the circuit. Even if the patient is receiving normal concentration of oxygen via the breathing circuit, the oxygenation of the arterial blood must be monitored and this can be done by use of uh, pulse oximetry or by analysis of arterial blood gas. Pulse oximetry is a non-invasive method that uses the principles of optical plethysmography and spectrophotometry. It gives us the value of percentage saturation of oxygenated hemoglobin, which is correlated well with the partial pressure of oxygen in the arterial blood by a sigma shaped oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. At the steep part of the curve, oxygen saturation correlates well, the, well with the PO2 of the arterial blood. Whereas as the curve reaches the uh, flat value, the values are not as predictable. For example, if the PO2 of the patient is 90 or more than 90, all the saturation that is displayed on the monitor is 100%. And the degree of hypo hyperoxia cannot be detected. If the patient has been receiving supplemental oxygen for quite some time and there is an apnea, there is a significant time lag. Uh, before which the oxygen saturation will start falling. And once it reaches the steep part of the curve, there will be a precipitous fall in the saturation. Also note, whenever the curve is shifted to the right or to the left due to physiological or pathological conditions, the relationship between PO2 and SpO2 does not is not the same as when the curve is uh, placed in the normal position. Normal ar arterial oxygen saturation does not ensure adequacy of oxygen delivery and utilization by the tissues. For this, we require to monitor arterial blood gases or mixed venous oxygen saturation whenever appropriate. Also, there, uh, since pulse oximetry relies on the pulsatile flow of uh, blood in the arteries, whenever there is abnormalities of the uh, pulsation or low pulsations or motion artifacts of the limb, or uh, changes in the ambient light, presence of dyes such as methyl hemoglobin, indigo carmine in the blood, or dishemoglobin, uh, or uh, dishemoglobin moieties such as carboxyhemoglobin or methyl hemoglobin, the readings by the pulse oximeter are not reliable. 
ASC states that ventilation of all the patients under anesthesia must be uh, monitored qualitatively by uh, visualizing chest excursion, observation of reservoir bag, and auscultation of breath sounds. Monitoring of end tidal carbon dioxide is essential during provision of general anesthesia and moderate to deep sedation. ASA strongly recommends that quantitative monitoring of the volume of expired gases should be done. And tidal carbon dioxide is essential to verify correct placement of endotracheal tube and laryngeal mass airways. And there should be a presence of audible alarm to warn us about changes in the end tidal CO2 values and in case of circuit disconnection. A lot of information can be gathered from the capnogram. This is the normal capnogram. There are many changes in the either in the shape or in the size of the capnogram that warn us of the many uh, clinical problems. Point D represents the uh, maximum level of carbon dioxide and at this point end tidal carbon dioxide is calculated. If in a patient in whom the end tidal carbon dioxide was normal and suddenly it drops to zero with loss of the capnogram waveform, it may be simply due to disconnection of the sampling line or it may, may be a pointer towards a potentially life-threatening situation such as acute severe hypotension, massive pulmonary embolism, circulatory arrest or displacement of the endotracheal tube from trachea into the esophagus. At this point, pulmonary, adequacy of pulmonary ventilation should be checked immediately and any physiological or mechanical factor must be rectified. The baseline doesn't reach to a value of zero if there is rebreathing of the expired gases. This information can also be derived from the capnogram. Circulation of the patient can be should be monitored by continuous display of ECG and every five minutes measurement of heart rate or arter and arterial blood pressure of the patient. ASA mandates that at least one of the following must also be measured during the duration of uh, whole duration of anesthesia. Palpation of pulse, auscultation of heart sounds, observation of arterial pressure waveform or uh, waveform by ultrasound and pulse, pulse plethysmography or oximetry. Just have a look at this slide. The digital uh, heart rate monitor displays a heart rate of 49, whereas upon observation of ECG and invasive blood pressure waveform, we can see that there is a uh, ACE is three in between, which lasts for almost four seconds, and there is a complete heart block. So this uh, re-emphasizes the need for monitoring ECG during the surgery. This is the standard ECG recording for correct and uh, accurate interpretation of the ECG, the clinician, clinician must pay close attention towards the lead selection, lead placement, use of filter by the filter mode by the ECG and calibration and gain settings on the monitor. Modern anesthesia machines provide display of the uh, five uh, provide dis uh, provide uh, display for five ECG lead monitoring system in which three limb leads one augmented limb lead and one precordial lead is uh, monitored and two of these leads are displayed simultaneously on the monitor screen. Whereas in the three lead system, uh, the three limb leads are uh, monitored and displayed. Uh, the electrode should be placed in such a way that they are outside the boundaries of the heart to, for uh, correct interpretation of the ECG. The precordial lead placement is crucial for monitoring ischemia because many studies have shown that lead mid, mid precordial leads, that is the leads from V3 to V5, are uh, needed for uh, uh, are very sensitive for to, for detection of ischemia. These these leads are placed like uh, as shown in this figure. There are other alternative lead system which provide us additional uh, with additional information such as the lead V4R. When the lead V4 is uh, placed on the right side in the mid lenticular line in the fifth intercostal space, it provides us information about the right ventricular ischemia. Whenever there are only three leads available, they can be placed in varying position as a surrogate marker for the precordial leads. Most important of them is the modified chest lead one where the positive or the left leg electrode is placed in the position of lead V1 and the negative or left arm electrode is placed in its normal position that is below the left clavicle and lead 3 is monitored in the screen. This lead is especially important in ICUs where it helps us uh, in observing the P wave morphology and for detection of arrhythmias. Normally, the, uh, the calibration of ECG machine is such that a change in one millivolt of voltage produces a displacement of one centimeter on the screen. 
if it is under calibrated or if it is over calibrated the proportional amplitude of all, all the ecg waves and magnitude of st segment elevation or depression changes proportionately so before commenting upon any of these a look should be a look must be uh, taken at the calibration settings of the anesthesia machine now a word about the filter selection there are various uh, artifacts during the recording of ecg the low frequency artifacts are produced by the respiratory movements of the patient whereas high frequency artifacts are produced by the shivering muscle fasciculations or uh, by uh, a uh, surrounding electrical equipment each uh, filter uh, in the ecg uses various types of filters and they have a different bandwidth bandwidth so as to allow uh, only certain degrees of frequencies to be filtered and uh, certain degrees of frequencies to be monitored in the diagnostic mode uh, the st analysis can be done more accurately and this mode cannot uh, negate the disturbances in the baseline whereas in the monitor mode the baseline is observed uh, more clearly and it is useful for detecting the arrhythmias but st segment cannot be commented upon accurately in the third mode which is the filter mode there are additional uh, disturbances from the surrounding surgical equipments they are also filtered and in it almost all the electrical disturbances are filtered out now coming over to the monitoring of blood pressure nowadays we have automated non invasive blood pressure monitors which monitor uh, the blood pressure of the patient by the oscillometric method they monitor they measure the mean uh, arterial pressure and they calculate the systolic and diastolic pressure by, uh, by the changes in the oscillation falsely high or low nibp recordings can be done when the cuff size is not appropriate or it is uh tied loosely so it, care should be taken in uh, mind to correct all these factors it should be noted that the mean bp correlates maximum with the invas uh, with the mean bp that is recorded by the invasive pressures and oscillometric nibp values tend to underestimate the mean arterial pressure during the periods of hypertension and they overestimate mean arterial pressure during the periods of hypotension below a mean arterial pressure of 65 mm of mercury nibp recordings are not reliable and we cannot use them to titrate the doses of vasopressor infusions they rely upon the pulsatile blood flow so in conditions of uh, low perfusion whenever peripheral pulses are weak the and or there are there is excessive motion of the limb or uh, tubing of the blood pressure cuff gets kinked or there are dysrhythmias the readings by the non invasive blood pressure are not reliable in obese patients there are uh, discrepancies between the cuff size and we need to monitor the invasive blood pressure because the uh, non invasive blood pressure from ankle calf or wrist uh, or from uh, forearm has not been validated with invasive blood pressures and it is a good practice to relocate the blood pressure cuff every few hours if the surgery is of a prolonged duration so as to prevent the risk of neuropraxia or cutaneous injury also note as the site of measurement is moved more peripherally into the body the measured systolic pressure tends to decrease and the diastolic pressure tends to decrease temperature monitoring temperature mean body temperature is indicated by the this equation so it is imperative to maintain to monitor and to maintain the core temperature the mean core temperature of the body is 36.5 degrees celsius to 37.3 degrees celsius and normally it is very tightly regulated but induction of anesthesia leads to impairment of thermoregulatory responses and the compen uh, and the threshold for various compensatory mechanism is also lowered so under anesthesia the goal of anesthesiologist should be to maintain the core intraoperative core temperature to 36 and 36 degrees celsius core temperature can be recorded by placing a probe with the pulmonary artery catheter into the pulmonary artery or by uh, placing the probe into the esophagus nasopharynx or tympanic membrane under neuroaxial anesthesia tympanic membrane uh, is used as a site of measurement of core temperature it should be noted that bladder and rectum do not correlate with the uh, core temperature and should not be monitored whenever the probe is uh, placed into the esophagus it should be inserted till the death when maximum heart sounds are heard or even more distinctly whereas nasopharyngeal temperature probe should be placed at a depth between 10 to 20 cm from the nails to conclude i want to emphasize that 
the automated monitors allow us to take the uh, vital readings of the patient rapidly frequently and in a more precise manner than is possible clinically but they cannot replace the clinical acumen of an experienced anesthesiologist and we must uh, apply uh, the results uh, uh, results available from the monitor judicially by after uh, uh, after examining their clinical relevance thank you if there are Ma'am, uh, your mute. Ma'am, can you unmute yourself? Hello, am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Ah. I take this opportunity to thank Dr. Rukma Bhatia for a very nice and concise talk on uh, this topic. Thank you so much. And uh, I, I thank both the speakers for the maiden talk, uh, session of APEC. And it should mark a good beginning. Thank you so much, both thank Dr. Nandi Koshar and Dr. Rukma Bhatia. And uh, I give it over to Dr. Nitin for further Thank you, ma'am, for your comment. Thank you, ma'am. Um, there are two questions in the chat box. I'll just read it out. Yeah, uh, you. I give it. Uh, over the to first you. question is what? You okay, ma'am? Okay. Uh, what will be the physical status in pregnancy? So this is for Dr. Anjali. Ma'am, are you there? Hello. I think she is answered in the chat box. Like. Uh, I just read it out. Pregnancy is ASA two, and it's no more an ASA one status in obstetrics. So even a normal pregnancy comes under ASA two. And the other question was uh, regarding the ASA status in a cancer patient. So she has written that cancer in remission is ASA two, active cancer is ASA three, and advanced stage will be an ASA four status. So she has answered these questions for the delegates. Thank you so much, ma'am. I thank Dr. M. D. Kaur, uh, Dr. Upma, Dr. Anjali for uh, being there for this session. Uh, mm -hmm. We'll now move on to our next session. Thank you, Dr. Nitin. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Nitin. Thank you. No. For the next session, I would like to invite the chair. Person. Dr. Kazi Hassan Ali, Sir is Professor and Chairman in the Department of Anesthesia and Critical Care at Jawaharlal Nehru. Sir has numerous achievements to his credit. He has an experience of more than 25 years in the teaching. Sir is trained in trauma resuscitation from Jay Prakash.